welcome to ADHD History, the show where we take overly large historical concepts and try and break them down in a very short period of time. For ADHD people, by ADHD people. The topic we're going to ADHD today is the invasion of Egypt in 270 of Common Era. Now, Egypt at the time was a Roman province, and it was one of the most secure, as it had no bordering enemies, and the province in between it and the nearest enemy was Syria, which was one of the most heavily militarized provinces to protect against the Persians. So who invaded and how did they do it? The invasion was carried out by the newborn but militarily competent Palmyrene Empire. And I'm sure you're thinking, what? what is the Palmyrene Empire? Why haven't I never heard of this? Now, if you've heard of it, you're probably a big fan of late antiquity, but if you haven't heard of it, let's talk about it right now. So what was the Palmyrene Empire? Basically, Palmyra had been a city-state that was kind of a semi-autonomous uh, trade city on the periphery of the Roman Empire. And a very ambitious and adept general named Odonathus had ascended to the throne uh, during the late 3rd century, uh, in like the 250s, and, and we're talking Common Era, and he... Uh, right after the Romans, or the Romans were heavily defeated at the Battle of Edessa by the Persians, led by Shapur the uh, First, Odenathus leads an army of peasant militia out from his wealthy little city and defeats the Persians and repels them from the Euphrates River. Uh, but Odenathus is not the leader of the Palmyrene Empire. So Odenathus was the king of Palmyra, and. He was given the title of Governor of the East by the Emperor Gallienus, who we'll get back to in a second. Um, but he was never an emperor. When he died, he was assassinated in 267, along with his eldest son, Hiran. Now, he was succeeded, in theory, by his ten-year-old son, Wahabalat, or in Latin, Vabalathus. But in reality, he was succeeded by his wife, the Queen Zenobia. Now, Queen Zenobia, quickly taking advantage of the situation she found herself in, proceeded to expand her dominion rapidly, uh, annexing Roman Arabia and Egypt. Her army entered Egypt, numbering 70,000 strong in October of 270, and by the end of the year had full control of the territory. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, how did she get away with this? What circumstances allowed a small city-state to annex heavily militarized portions of the Roman Empire. Well, a little circumstance called the Crisis of the Third Century, one of the most tremendous, all-changing events in Roman history. So in 235 of the Common Era, a, the last of the Severan dynasty was assassinated, leaving a power vacuum that would not be filled for quite a while in any proper measure. Over the next 50 years, 26 men would be acclaimed emperor. Wars were fought constantly between different emperors as they usurped and fought. And on top of this, there was a massive plague, the Cyprian Plague, which came in and decimated the Roman world. Some cities losing up to 60% of their population. This was unbelievably destructive and we don't really know what it was. Although modern theories suspect that it was either influenza, uh, a phylovirus, or smallpox. Now, in addition to this plague and the wars of succession, we also have two secession states, one of them being Palmyra, and the other being the Gallic Empire, where most of what is now France breaks off from the Roman Empire, declaring independence. And in addition to this, we have a series of barbarian invasions. We have the Persians, who invaded several times during this period, uh, mostly under Shapur I, who ruled for a very long 30-year reign, nothing compared to his uh, someone who shares his name a little further down the line, Shapur II, who would rule for 70 years, but he's a century later. But anyway, Shapur I, and then also there were two major Germanic confederations, the Franks and the Alamanni, who staged massive raids and invasions of the Roman Empire during this time. Given these overwhelming, chaotic circumstances, it's pretty easy to understand how 
Zenobia might have been able to take advantage of the situation and turn herself into an empress in just three years. Unfortunately for Zenobia, it was not to last. She was... Uh, Palmyra was o invaded and she was overthrown by the Emperor Aurelian in 272 of the Common Era. Now, if you don't know what's going on in Rome at the time, you might imagine Aurelian was probably the successor to Gallienus, but you'd be wrong. There were no less than two emperors in between that time period. That Gallienus uh, was succeeded then by Claudius Gothicus, who only reigned for two years, but defeated the Goths, who had been a real thorn in the empire's side for a very long time, and he kind of drove them out for a, kind of an extended period. They wouldn't really threaten Rome's borders. Uh, and then Gothicus was succeeded by Quintilus, who had a pretty uneventful six-month reign, followed finally by Aurelian, who is known as Restitutor Orbis Invictus, the undefeated restorer of the world, because he conquered both the Palmyrene and Gallic empires, bringing them back into the fold. And he would be succeeded by Diocletian, who would bring the crisis to an end. Sadly, we don't really know what happened to Zenobia after her capture. Some say she was executed, um, others say she was brought back to Rome and kept alive. The second theory kind of tracks more because Aurelian captured the leaders of the Gallic Empire as well and kept them alive after parading them through the streets to celebrate his victory. Um, and so that's most likely what happened to her, and then she died sometime after that, but that's about all we know. Um, and today, she's kind of an icon. Uh, you'll see her kind of used as like a feminist symbol as this powerful queen who rejected the authority of Rome and fought back quite effectively, defeating Romans in Arabia and, and in Egypt. And she's also become a nationalist symbol for modern-day Syria, as a lot of Middle Eastern countries and, and a lot of post-colonial countries in general kind of use their ancient history uh, as a, a symbol of their nationalism. Things like uh, Saddam in Iraq evo trying to evoke Babylon and, and uh, in Lebanon, certain Lebanese nationalist factions using the, the legacy of Phoenicia. But yeah, so that's, uh, that's the story of Queen Zenobia. Uh, if you like this content, feel free to click all the buttons that people tell you to click. If you didn't, feel free to not. Um, I, if you want to go in the comments and tell me how I'm wrong and stupid, please do that. Or if you want to tell me that you liked it, please do that as well. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye.